lightning scarred Mars and Venus and uh, that image there is of the western chaos region of Valles Marineros. It's quite an amazing canyon. As I said it's earlier, it stretches one third of the way around the planet. And it was Ralph Jurgens once again, who initially pointed to this as having been a, an electrical scar. He said it was as if a great arc had been struck and dragged across the surface of Mars. But what do we find? The online educator's guide here is from the American Museum of Natural History and it's an online educator's guide. Its subject is the birth of the moon. And here we have a field of rubble once again. They have a habit of wanting to build planets from fields of rubble. This time it's the moon. And of course the idea, you can see the earth is glowing slightly in the background. The idea being that the earth has just been hit by some massive mars size object and all of the rubbish that's floating around uh, subsequent to the collision is now going to form the moon. When all you have is gravity, the only major sculpting tools you have are collisions and explosions. And here's Ralph Jurgens, again. <clears throat> and you can see there the article uh, of the Moon and Mars, part one, which he published in uh, Ponce. Has it got the date there? No. It was back in the 70s anyway. And the first part, part one, was about the origin of lunar sinuous rills. And in my opinion, it was a brilliant piece of work. It's an object lesson of how to do science. So once again, Ralph Jurgens led the way in applying the concept of electric discharge machining to explain cratering on the moon, sinuous rills and Valles Marineris on Mars. He says, I intend to suggest that electrical scars of vast proportions are indeed in evidence, particularly on the surface of Mars and the moon. I will emphasize that it is just such markings that constitute the most recent features of the, these bodies. And particularly on the moon, you can see those great rayed craters, Tycho, Aristarchus, Copernicus and Kepler. And the interesting thing that uh, Ralph Jurgens pointed out is that those rays, particularly with Tycho down here, don't actually radiate from the centre of the crater. They, some of them are tangential. So it had nothing to do with an explosion. It's particularly st striking here, this one here, just comes to the edge of the crater and it would have passed it by. But he showed that they were a series of small craters formed by electrical currents traversing the surface of the moon, just a superficial scar, causing tiny craters along the way, and they were heading towards the scene of uh, an interplanetary discharge which struck down at Tycho, the crater. But the initial discharge uh, and the return stroke, lightning stroke, was slightly offset so that the crater doesn't sit at the um, centre of those raid craters. Very interesting. It's, I'm amazed that uh, the people who proposed this as an explosion crater, an impact crater, didn't notice that. One of the things that Ralph uh, did was to refer to this guy uh, who's turned out this paper and he's gone on and done other things since. He's a very smart guy. His name is Dr. Brian Ford. And he did an experiment where he tested the idea that the craters on the moon were due to electrical machining. Uh, Brian Ford uh, is a true interdisciplinary scientist. And I've seen an interview with him uh, on, tele on YouTube. Uh, and he's mainly interest, interested in biology. But his basic view is that if you can't explain your science to your grandmother, then you don't understand it. And I like that approach. He particularly dislikes the use of jargon to exclude outsiders. <clears throat> he gave an example in the biological realm where he said, you can be in a laboratory with biologists and they'll be uh, working on blood cells and they'll call them blood cells. As soon as an outsider comes in, they're erythrocytes. 
He notes that since the 17th century, lunar craters have been attributed only to volcanism or impact. But in 1960, January 65, he published this report of his experiment comparing spark machine craters with lunar craters. He concluded, it is clear that craters produced by an electrical discharge show central peaks in the ratio of approximately one to three in the small craters, or nearer 50-50, where the largest craters are concerned. This is approximate to the pattern seen on the moon, and so this peculiar occurrence can be explained for the first time. He also went on to warn of the dangers of electrical discharges to spacecraft and astronauts, interestingly. So that was back in uh, 1965. The other thing about the uh, moon's craters is that they're almost all circular. And this is a, a characteristic of electrical discharges because lightning always strikes the ground vertically, never at an angle, whereas impacts can come in at any angle. And this is a, a strike against the impact theory, a major strike. I've read you the conclusion, so we can move on. The other thing is that when you have a lightning strike, you often get more than a single stroke. You'll often get multiple strokes, one after the other. In the case of these uh, lunar craters, you will find a disturbing number of circular craters perched on the rim of another crater, small craters on the rims of larger craters, and you can see, so you can count them there. That was something that disturbed Tommy Gold, uh, he, he couldn't understand, and he, he said so at a, a meeting about the, um, the lunar surface. He, couldn't un he said, there is, we've got a real problem here because they not only look fresh, and that was something the astronauts also remarked on, these craters look very fresh, but you have this association of a, a number of craters perched in a particular way. In a large crater, the... Birkeland current that strikes the surface is actually rotating. So you often get corkscrew craters, and there are some examples on the moon. But the major thing about that is that it leaves the central peak. You've got two rotating arcs, and the central peak is left standing. And you see that in large craters. Also, it tends to melt the floor. The heat of the uh, discharge will give you a flat, melted floor. Now, there's no reason to expect that from an impact. Of course, the explanation for the central peaks with the impact model is that they use uh, a mixture of milk and cream and they drop something into it and, of course, you get the rebound and they, that's their explanation for the central peak. But I understand in Canada, at Sudbury, there is a, um, a buried crater and they've sampled the central peak, and the material there is the same as the surrounding countryside. So you'd expect if this is material from beneath the surface that's rebounded, that wouldn't be the case. There's another uh, big crater in uh, Africa too, the Fredofort Dome, it's called. And it was, they have what they call tachylites, which is rock which is, shows uh, shock treatment. So it has these... Um, uh, almost bullet-shaped cones pointing towards where the shock came from, uh, preserved in the rock. The interesting thing is that in the rim, those bullets, if you like, are pointing downwards. Not only that, they're not all pointing to the same spot. So that it wasn't a single impact or explosion. It was something that was moving and it was below ground. All of this matches the electrical model and uh, causes severe problems for impact theory. OK, that's quite enough about that. This was uh, in a 1950 National Geographic where a lightning bolt, which actually killed a few players on a baseball field, uh, gouged this 13-metre trench. The report said ground's resistance to current blew the earth like a fuse. Soil was thrown to each side, creating levees along the rim. And along the uh, floor of that trench, the more sinuous path of the lightning could be seen. In fact, you can pick it out in, the, uh, in this image. 
And this is typical of the sinuous rills on the moon. There was often a central channel in a wider channel. The only explanation that uh, the um, selenologists or the planetary scientists have been able to come up with for this, for the sinuous rills on the moon is flowing lava with a collapsed lava tube. But some of these lava, uh, sorry, these sinuous rills are kilometres wide. You cannot form a roof of rock kilometres wide. And what's more, any of those lava tubes on Earth, once they've collapsed, you have breaks where there's a rubble, the roof has fallen in. They're quite obviously different to the sinuous rills on the moon, which are quite clean from end to end. And what's more, they peter out onto the maria, the seas or the flat surface. There's no outflow. What's happened is that the discharge has travelled from the flat area uh, along the sinuous rill and it ends in a circular crater. So the current to satisfy the discharge from space has travelled some distance carving this tortuous lightning channel. In Ponce number 9, fall in the fall of 1974, Jurgens gave a detailed argument for the electric discharge model of sinuous rills on the moon, and I've just discussed some of those points. Jurgens considered all standard geological options plus a new one due to an electric discharge travelling across the surface to the touchdown point of a lightning bolt. His comparison table of the real characteristics uh, versus origin theories is an object lesson in planetary science. Three of the standard models are precluded by the evidence, and in the other one, the evidence is largely irrelevant, so much for the standard models. And you notice that the worst score, lava tubes with four strikes against it, is the favoured standard explanation for sinuous rills. His eruption of electrical breakdown channel theory stands out against all competitors. It is totally predictable or permissible on basis of theory. It was a very good piece of work. Electrical scars. On the left is a flashover damage to a high voltage insulator and you can see the kind of pattern that's formed. And on the right is the Mars Chaos region, which shows the same kind of scarring. And this is the thing about electrical activity. It is scalable over a vast uh, number of uh, orders of magnitude. Planetary scientists are unaware of such, this kind of breakthrough because they've been told by astrophysicists that electricity doesn't do anything in space. And in my opinion, this demonstrates the dysfunctional fragmented, over-specialised science that we suffer from today. Surface arcs. Here we go. This is a 10,000 volt high energy electrical discharge uh, that I performed with uh, some colleagues in 1998 in Melbourne. It's across insulating sheets of glass and bakelite. The energy of the discharge was such that it actually burnt a hole through a, a thick sheet of glass. But when a strong arc is established, the discharge channel is extremely sinuous, as you'll see at a couple of instants just then. And that's the form of the sinuous rill. It's also the form of many of the scars you'll see on Mars and Venus and so on. Oh, I thought the cameramen wanted... <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> right, uh, you note the characteristic uh, rivers and tributaries form of the discharge also. It's also very noisy. This is another experiment I did in a garage, and this is one of the uh, things about the electric universe. We've got a number of people doing experiments in garages. This one was done in Canberra. The test piece there is on a, an aluminium block, which is the, uh, in this case, is the earth, the, the uh, cathode in the discharge. And it's clay mixed with some carbon powder and dried in an oven. The clay surface is the anode, oh, sorry, 
Is this the anode one? Or some, yeah, I beg your pardon. In this case, that vertical rod there is earthed. It's negative, if you like, with respect to that aluminium block beneath. So the carbon powder was just to give a little bit of um, conductivity to the clay, and we dried it as well as we could. And then we struck this arc, which was also high voltage, but not as great current as you saw in that last experiment. Here we go. I'm sorry about the quality. Uh, the camera we use isn't as good as the ones we have now. I think there was also sound to this, but it doesn't matter. I may have turned it off. But you'll notice how the arc moves around here. It stays within a circle and then the current was turned up and uh, it stuck to one spot and burnt a spot. And when you look at the resulting scar, the cross section there is the same or roughly the same as Olympus Mons. So an anode scar is a raised blister. In addition, there was a little uh, moisture still left in the clay and that ran away from the crater. Now you see many craters on Mars which has this flow effect away from the crater. So it, it seems that some of those scars on Mars were caused when Mars still had a moist surface at least. The arc's fairly steady and moves in a circle forming a raised blister and the remaining moisture flows away and the power increase causes the arc to stick and melt a spot. If you look at Olympus Mons, this is a giant anode scar. It's the same as we see on lightning conductors. Lightning conductors also form that raised blister with a bell shape. It's also got circular pitting at the, at the summit. It's an anode scar where the arc sticks to one spot and causes intense heating even if there is movement between the two bodies, that is the two planets, involved in the electrical exchange. It sticks there. And you can see the circular scars there. Successive strikes along the same channel, as I said, lightning often has multiple strokes and forms craters on the rim and so on. That's precisely what's happened here. They're called calderas on Olympus Mons, but they're perfectly circular, and you'll notice they're sort of like cookie-cutter effects, and one of them, as you can see, is perched right on the rim, is centred on the rim. Olympus Mons also has a borrow pit, because when that material rises, it pulls material from around it, so there's a kind of moat. Olympus Mons has that, and it also has racetrack rings because it, it forms rings. Uh, we're not quite sure why, but we see that on lightning arrestors. And Olympus Mons has the remains of uh, one of those rings up in the uh, north west. The rest of it has been covered by material that may have come from Vallis Marineris when it, that damage was done. Here's a cathode scar, and this is quite different. The clay surface, once again, is the cathode, uh, and this time the electrode above is the positive terminal, so let's see what happens. See how it dances all over the place? This is the kind of scarring that forms crater chains and uh, multiple craters in one spot, or very close together. And crater chains are an enigma because you cannot form them by a body disrupting and then forming a very neat line of craters. There's no way that that will happen. That's enough of that. Here we see an example of one of these travelling cathode arcs. You see it's almost like a cookie cutter has gone along and moved just a small amount between each um, point. And you'll notice the material's all been removed. And this is a feature of arcs. It will move material against gravity. Arc welders know this quite well. So it'll lift and clean the material from the surface. 
There's no way water can do that. I think the only geological explanation that uh, makes even the slightest sense is uh, sinkholes, where you have uh, fractures or something like that, and the material above is uh, soft or sandy, and it can fall in uh, along the crack, forming a series of um, some, something that looks a little bit like this. But the, that explanation is strained when you see the sinuosity and the fact that this connects to another channel, which is even bigger, and the patterns repeated at different scales. And here's the mighty battle scar on Mars, Vallis Marineris. Mars was known to the American Indians as Scarface. You can see the scars here. And this is the Aztec god, Hipe, I think, displaying his deeply scarred face. It stretches a third of the way around Mars and two million cubic kilometres of rock was removed from the canyons. That was the uh, estimate. That's a huge amount of material. And where's it gone? It's certainly not on the... Uh, in the... Yeah, its canyons are up to nine kilometres deep. So if you think staring over the edge of the Grand Canyon is uh, quite an experience, imagine <laughs> staring into this, uh, one of these canyons. Where did the rock go? There's some of it. It's strewn all over the place, and a lot of it, of course, went into space. That's just uh, the, the stuff that fell back. Broken, charred, it looks burnt, a lot of it. On uh, the uh, DVD that we have, uh, the second one in the series about uh, Mars and its scarring, this diagram is shown where this is the altitude, these colours, and uh, blue shows that you're getting down to about four kilometres below the average uh, uh, radius of the uh, planet. So about one third of the planet's surface, mostly in the northern hemisphere, lies three to six kilometres lower in elevation than the southern two thirds. This is a first order relief uh, feature on a par with the elevation difference between the Earth's continents and ocean basins, which is interesting. So, so this shows that electrical scarring can form ocean basins. Just a moment. catch up here. And there's a difference in impact crater density between the two hemispheres. The crust in the southern highlands has a maximum thickness of about 58 kilometres or 36 miles, while the crust in the northern lowlands peaks at around 32 kilometres or 20 miles in thickness. The dichotomy is expressed in two other ways as a difference in impact crater density and crustal thickness between the two hemispheres. Okay, as an important aside, this shows that the mystery of the Earth's oceanic basins may be explained by electrical pole-to-pole -pole sculpting. Global tectonics is failing and needs an alternative. The continental terraces on Earth of the uh, continents, the shelves, continental shelves of the great ocean basins, their central ridges with orthogonal coronal discharge patterns, all argue for electrical sculpting. So uh, the next thing to talk about then is the polar configuration. How does this come in? I've shown it here schematically. Proto-Saturn, Venus, Mars and Earth is down here. We're looking up here. Proto-Saturn as a former star was more positively charged than its satellites. Remember it was a star, it was the anode, positively charged with respect to its environment. Venus was ejected from proto-Saturn and uh, <coughs> was more positively charged than Mars. And you can see it was desperately trying to accommodate to its new environment with that um, massive discharge. So when Mars came close, in discharges between Venus and Mars, the northern hemisphere of Mars would have been stripped in a cathode-type discharge. 
the material would have been removed from the northern hemisphere. So this may explain that uh, Mars was practically um, scalped. So we come to what's the significance then for the other bodies in this, the polar configuration. Removing electrons from Mars reduced its mass, and I'll go into the reason for this tomorrow when I talk about electric cosmology. And the gravitational attraction so that it moved away from Venus and towards Earth. On nearing the Earth, Mars discharged with its southern hemisphere as the anode. So it was a different kind, remember, a different type of scarring. And that's what you see. Uh, craters on the um, southern hemisphere of Mars and uh, a flat um, etched northern hemisphere. It's the same kind of thing as they use in an industry as electric discharge machining to form very cleanly cut surfaces. Receiving electrons, Mars mass increased and it moved back towards Venus. So Mars was acting like a kind of oscillating charge carrier between Venus and the Earth. So Mars was at times a threatening giant and at others a dwarf to observers on Earth as the planet oscillated up and down the polar column, suffering different hemispheric destruction in the north and south. And as I said, I'll discuss this change in mass and gravity in electric cosmology tomorrow. After many years of puzzling over how the Valles Marineris gash was formed, NASA published this altitude map of the area. It became clear that the overall shape was that of a barred spiral galaxy, of all things. So the centre of the discharge is at the central bulge and the current flowed along the vast canyons that form the spiral arms, up to the east and down to the west. Up to the east, down to the west. Same shape as this barred spiral. Because when uh, Ralph Jurgens wrote that article about it looked as though an arc had been dragged across the surface, I, I couldn't quite figure it out because th there was a difference between the scarring in the uh, west to the east. So when the um, galactic discharge um, idea struck me, it all began to make sense. And because plasma phenomena are scalable over at least 14 orders of magnitude, it's, it's uh, not out of order to suggest such a thing. Because plasma phenomena are scalable over at least 14 orders of magnitude. And the shape, as I said, was that of a barred spiral galaxy. Now, Later on, when we were doing the DVD, Dave Talbot pointed out that the channels in the east and the mountains in the west delineate the arms differently. And that was actually uh, very interesting because, as shown earlier, the scars on a cathode tend to remove material and those on the anode to raise material. So this pattern on Mars supports the evidence just presented that the northern hemisphere behaved as a cathode and the southern hemisphere as an anode in the Mars electrical exchanges with Venus and Earth, respectively. Did I just skip one then? I did, the Grand Canyon. So if you want to have a look at what an electrical scar looks like on Earth, this is probably one of the best examples. It's interesting, we've got one in Australia too, just west of Sydney. It's very easy to get to. Uh, I've holidayed up there in the Blue Mountains. It was a kind of a very difficult uh, place to pass back in the pioneering days and it took a long while to find a path through there to get to the interior of Australia. But this is a small, very small version of what you could expect to see on Mars. And there are many more of these to be found on Google Earth, of course. Here's Venus, the radiant star. It had an unexpected very high surface temperature, a young surface, a cometary magneto tail, all of these things I mentioned earlier. And of course, it has that 
uh, we have the prehistoric memory of having radiated these streamers and you can see that the result was to form this filamentary pattern of scars around the equator. You see similar patterns on some of the other bodies in the solar system too. So, Venus's heavy atmosphere, as I said, favours filamentary scarring over cratering because in the dense atmosphere, the discharge, remember uh, Don was talking earlier about how the uh, discharge tends to pinch down as the current density increases. Well, as the density of the material it's going through increases, you get a more filamentary discharge. And here's a case of sinuous rills on Venus. You see these uh, very sinuous channels which end up in a crater of some description up here. There's a whole field of them. That's something you see on the moon too. You'll often see a field of these things. And in one case, or, or you know, on the moon, you'll see two channels that run parallel. And this is typical of electric currents that are running at the same time. They'll uh, tend to run parallel. So that has all the features of an electrical discharge across the surface of Venus. The sinuosity, variation in cross-section and defiance of gravity make the official volcanic explanations not just unlikely but impossible. And the next one I like, the river Styx. Because I went to a presentation at the um, Deep Space Tracking Centre just outside Canberra, my hometown, uh, where they presented the first information they had back from the Magellan Orbiter concerning this river. And uh, I asked the question, does it have levees? And the, the guy said yes. And that was, I was delighted because this is what I expected. But this thing here is incredible. It goes for 6,800 kilometres and it goes uphill and down dale uh, up to two kilometres. Now there's no liquid that's going to do that. All of the characteristics of that is one long streak of lightning across the surface of Venus. The sinuosity, the variation in cross-section and the defiance of gravity make the official volcanic explanations not just unlikely but impossible. And these are some of the features you can find in there. There's grooves and ridges along the channel. That's what this diagram here is showing. Matching Jurgen's criteria for a sinuous realm. Yep. These observations indicate that it is likely to have been formed uh, by mechanical rather than thermal erosion because the idea was that you'd had this, because Venus is already at the temperature of enough to melt lead, these channels, if there's a flowing liquid, has to be something very hot and molten which causes mechanical erosion. And that's the only explanation they could come up with. So, as I said earlier, the electric universe uh, returns the excitement of scientific discovery to the individual. You don't need huge laboratories and billions of dollars. There are all sorts of things that can be discovered uh, practically by garage experiments. Uh, one of my colleagues here, CJ Ransom, has done experiments uh, where he's produced the Martian blueberries with electrical discharges. That was one of the puzzles, of course. When you looked at the surface of Mars with some of the rovers, they found these strewn fields of um, blueberries, they called them, because the hematite globules, which were, looked slightly blue. Uh, but um, as you can see here, uh, CJ was able to produce the same thing in his garage with a, a simple electrical experiment. Electrical craters and rivers have been demonstrated. And electrical tornadoes like those on Mars have been shown recently. 
But what's more, some papers have been published. Uh, CJ uh, and I, as a co-author, um, managed to have a paper in the IEEE Plasma Sciences section discussing the formation of these uh, blueberries. But this kind of research is inspiring others to get involved so that there is now a group, a Thunderbolts group, discussing and sharing videos and images of their latest experiments. And two of the leaders being CJ Ransom and Billy Yelverton, who's doing very good work. And the idea is that you perform an experiment, you show the video, and you talk, discuss amongst the group and look for ideas, of what to try next, or what is this actually showing us. And I think this is uh, great because science should not be restricted to so-called experts. Discoveries come from individuals and it's just great seeing individuals being inspired to do this. So, Mars and Venus hold the key. Planetary science is an extension of earthly geology to other bodies in the solar system. So until geology accepts the possibility of electrical modification of planetary surfaces and atmospheres, we shall not understand our solar system and the reason for the glaring differences between the principal features of all planets and moons. They all have their individual histories written across their faces. But in particular, Mars and Venus hold the key to the recent history of the solar system. Thank you. <laughs>